Today, the main subject will be Chapter 8, Identity and Access Management. These are the corresponding domains from CompTIA. Domain 1.0, General Security Concepts. Domain 2.0, Threats, Vulnerabilities, and Mitigation. Domain 4.0, Security Operations. In this context, identity is primarily concerned with attributes and characteristics that distinguish one entity from another in a security domain. Identity is a crucial aspect of managing access control, authentication, authorization, and accountability. These are some common ways we allow a user or an individual to assert their identity or assert their claim of identity. Usernames, certificates, tokens, SSH keys, and smart cards. Let's take a quick second to talk about authentication and authorization. Just because a user or device claims a specific identity, it doesn't necessarily mean that, that identity really belongs to them. We still need to authenticate a user or a device. We need some way to verify that the identity is legitimate or the identity claimed is legitimate. Authentication doesn't necessarily indicate authorization. So when we combine authentication and authorization, we verify the identity and then allow access to system resources. We're going to cover a handful of authentication technologies. EAP, CHAP, 802.1x, RADIUS, TACAX Plus, and Kerberos. Up first, we have EAP, Extensible Authentication Protocol, EAP. EAP is an authentication protocol. It's primarily used for wireless networks. So it's an authentication protocol for wireless networks. There are various implementations. EAP TLS, LEAP, EAP TTLS, other protocols use the EAP protocol with their own messaging standards. So again, EAP is a very common choice for wireless network authentication. Next one on the list, CHAP, Challenge Handshake Authentication Protocol. Again, CHAP is an authentication protocol for enhanced security. It offers more security than PAP. It utilizes a three-way handshake. This is the three-way handshake for CHAP 802.1x. This is the IEEE standard for network access control, NAC. We use this for authenticating devices connecting to a network. When we're talking about 802.1x, we're usually talking about, or we are talking about physically connecting to a network. The process will look something like this. You'll have some kind of device wanting to connect to the network. The authenticator will check in with them and verify their identity using something like RADIUS. It will check against the authentication server. The authentication server may use something like LDAP or Active Directory to verify the identity information. Up next, we have RADIUS, Remote Authentication Dial-In User Service. Remote Authentication Dial-In User Service, RADIUS. RADIUS is a common authentication, authorization, and accounting system for network devices and services. It operates on TCP or UDP in a client-server model. RADIUS uses obfuscated passwords, specifically a shared secret plus an MD5 hash, resulting in weaker password security. Traffic between the network access server and the RADIUS server is usually encrypted. TACAX Plus. It was designed by Cisco, and it was an improvement upon the original TACAX. TACAX Plus is the new protocol. These are the key takeaways. Uses TCP traffic for authentication, authorization, and accounting services. Has full packet encryption. Offers a granular command and control. Kerberos is an authentication protocol. It's primarily designed for when you have a trusted host over an untrusted network. So you have a trusted host over an untrusted network. It uses a stronger authentication to protect its traffic uses a ticket-based authentication system involving three key elements, primary, instance, and realms. Primary is associated with usernames, instance is associated with differentiating users, realms are associated with user groups. This may help you remember the term a little bit better. Kerberos was for mythology. It was a three-headed dog that guarded the gates to the underworld. So Kerberos is a authentication protocol that guards our systems using three key elements. Okay, now we're going to talk about some single sign-on technology. First, let's define single sign-on. The idea behind single sign-on is it's some kind of system that allows users to log in with a single identity across multiple systems. So an easy example of this would be something like Gmail. You log into your Gmail, you're also logged into YouTube. 
Google Drive, or a whole suite of Google services. These are the ones that we're going to look at, LDAP, SAML, OpenID, and OpenAuth, Lightweight Directory Access Protocol, LDAP. This is a protocol used for identity management. One of the key benefits, it offers a hierarchical structure. This graphic should help us visualize the hierarchy type structure that we're talking about with LDAP. It's commonly used in Windows or Linux environments. So we can have our different directories here. For example, we could have a HR directory with a subcategory for a payroll directory and benefits directory. We could also have a security directory with the different um, subdirectories associated with that. Again, we could have more directories as well. This is just an example of the hierarchy or hierarchical structure that we have with LDAP. Up next, we have SAML, Security Assertion Markup Language. It's a XML-based standard for exchanging authentication and authorization data. This will often be associated with web applications. OpenID. This is an open standard for decentralized authentication. When you go to a website or try to log into some service and it asks you if you want to log in with your Google account or your Microsoft account or your Amazon account, that would be an example of or could potentially be an example of using something like OpenID to accomplish that. Some of the major identity providers would be something like Google, Microsoft, Amazon. The key takeaway here is when you see the login with functionality, you should associate that with OpenID. There's some key acronyms here, identity providers, IDPS, relying parties, RPs, open authorization. This is a open standard used for authorization by websites and applications allows users to grant third-party access to their information without sharing their credentials. Let's talk about the idea behind federation. Essentially, the idea behind federation is it's referring to the arrangement between multiple organizations or systems to share identity authentication processes. This allows users to access services across different domains, platforms, or different systems. And the idea is that these users or systems can do that with a single set of credentials instead of managing credentials across several different sites. We covered some of this terminology in the last slide, but we'll just go over it again real quick. The principal is typically the end user. Identity provider, or IDPS, is the individual or the organization providing the identity and authentication services. And the service providers, or SPs, provide services to users whose identities have been attested by an identity provider. We're going to cover some authentication methods, starting with the most, probably the most common version, which would be passwords. I'm not gonna cover all of these, but this is a quick list of best practices provided by NIST. This is a quick screenshot from a Windows machine in the local group policy editor, setting the password policy for this organization or the system. We're going to quickly cover password managers and passwordless access or passwordless authentication. Password managers allow secure storage, creation, and management of passwords. For passwordless authentication, we're usually talking about some kind of app, device, or security key that will take care of authentication for you. So no password will be required. Multi-factor authentication is something that's becoming increasingly common. Instead of just using a username and password, we have some other factors that we use to authenticate the user. This can be a, an extremely powerful tool for helping us protect accounts. Generally, multi-factor authentication will take advantage of one of these four things. Something you know, something you have, something you are, or somewhere you are. One-time password. As the name implies, this is a password that's used one time, or some kind of passcode that will only be used one time. There are two main categories, TOTP, time-based one-time passwords. They expire after a certain period of time, HMAC-based passwords. These are hash-based one-time passwords. If you are familiar with the Google or the Microsoft Authenticator apps, this would be a good example of a time-based one-time password. You get some kind of passcode to your Authenticator app, and it will expire every so many seconds. Another thing we can use for authentication is biometrics. This would fall into the something you are category. This includes categories like fingerprints, retina scanning, iris rec recognition, facial recognition, voice recognition, vein recognition, and gait analysis. One good way to manage access is through account types. We can have user accounts, privileged or administrative accounts, shared or generic accounts. Generally, these are frowned upon. While it may be convenient, it is generally not great for security. 
It makes it hard to know who accessed what system. Guest accounts, these are often used for limited access and service accounts. Service accounts are often associated with applications or services. We're gonna cover some common access control schemes. Attribute-based access control, role-based access control, role-based access control, mandatory access control, discretionary access control. Let's run through them. Role-based access control, often called RBAC. In this scenario, privileges are based on a user's specific role. For example, if you are a network administrator, you may need access to certain systems. If you are a security administrator, you may need access to a completely different set of systems. If you work for the payroll department or a completely different department altogether, you will have a different role and require different levels of access. This can be very popular in an enterprise environment where job roles or specific roles are clearly outlined and categorized. Up next, we have DAC, discretionary access control. Enforcement in this case is carried out by object owners who set permissions on specific files or directories. This is more common in personal computing environments. MAC, mandatory access control. Just to be clear, this has nothing to do with the computer system MAC. This is just mandatory access control. In this case, the enforcement is carried out by the operating system based on centralized policies. Users can't modify access controls or security policies. Historically, this would be commonly used in government or military environments. Up next, we want to do rule-based access control. This can get a little bit tricky. We have RBAC, rule-based access control, and then we have rule-based access control. In this case, we have a set of rules or some kind of access control list that apply to objects and resources. So access attempts are checked against some kind of rule set. A common example might be something like a firewall. We use this to manage access to our network or network resources. We also have attribute-based access control, ABAC, Enforcement is based on attributes of the user. This enables a fairly complex rule set characteristics. It is flexible, context sensitive, and can be complex to manage. This is ideal for application security and enterprise systems, databases, um, content management systems, microservices, and APIs. We have a couple additional access control concepts, time of day restrictions and least privilege. For time of day restrictions, as the name implies, we are providing some kind of restriction based on the time of day. Least privilege is also fairly intuitive. The idea here is that we want to provide the minimum amount of access required for someone to do their job. That's all we have for this week. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you have a wonderful week. Bye.